this is a public service. Good morning and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. I'm Michael Bolden with the 10th Amendment Center and this is the show for Wednesday, May 31st, 2023. And today I want to talk about something that's almost always ignored. It's just never really brought up in discussion when it comes to what government is doing, well, to all of us, <laughs> to the Constitution, to our liberty. And that is the oath of office. And to kick it off, I want to start out with a tweet that got me thinking about this for this episode that we posted over at 10th Amendment yesterday. It's all spelled out with a spell out the word. Follow us there. I will link to this in the show notes. It's twitter.com slash 10th Amendment. Anyways, it's impossible to both keep your oath of office in support of the Constitution and vote in favor of the debt ceiling deal. No one's discussing what their oath tells them to do. Most of what I'm seeing, whether it's from supposed good guys or supposed bad guys, I think they all are on the bad end of the spectrum. And maybe you'll understand why as I go through this, because I'm taking the view of the founders as my own. But there's very little discussion about, well, what does the Constitution authorize? What does my oath allow me to do? It's all about, well, we got to do this or this team is doing that. Or if we don't do this, this will happen but if they follow the Constitution, they can't support this kind of thing, nor should we even be in this type of a situation anyways. But this oath doesn't uh, enforce itself, obviously, and we'll get to that as well. Here, first of all, the oath of office for the presidency. Article 2, Section 1, Clause 8 of the Constitution reads before, this is from the Constitution itself, before he enter on the execution of his office, he shall take the following oath or affirmation, quote, I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So the number one role is to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. And we're always hearing from people, oh, my number one job is to keep you safe. My number one job is to keep this program going. My number one job is to do this, that, this, that. But really, their number one job is to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States or for the United States, really. Uh, Article 6, Clause 3, Oaths of Office Generally. This is basically everyone else. It reads like this. The senators and representatives before mentioned and the members of the several state legislatures. Keep in mind, everyone on the state level takes an oath to support not only their own state constitution, we have to remember there are multiple constitutions, they support their own state constitution and the constitution for the United States. That doesn't mean they become federal agents, but they can't take any action that violates their oath, that is, helps violate the constitution. I'll get to that as well. The senators and representatives before mentioned and the members of the several state legislatures and all executive and judicial officers both of the United States and of the several states shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. But no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. A lot of people ask questions, why is that? There was some discussion from James Wilson and a number of others in the Philadelphia Convention and elsewhere that if you had an oath, you had to have this was based on a religious viewpoint. And so they were clarifying that you can take an oath or have an affirmation even if you weren't a religious person, although they preferred people of faith. Uh, but that's a different discussion. Anyway, so the current uh, here from the U.S. Senate, here's the current oath the way they put it. And then. In 1789, first, the first Congress adopted a simple, simple oath, quote, I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That's all you need. But they have a little bit longer. They put it this way. I do solemnly swear that or affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Mm, that's juicy. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. I think most of them do the latter. 
and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter, so help me God. Now, if you think about what that really means, that means they have to support the Constitution totally. Not just kind of, not just kind of getting there, but it's an all, it's a, there's no gray area in this whatsoever. Here's how Thomas Jefferson described things in his opinion on the constitutionality of a national bank. This was 10 months to the day before the uh, Bill of Rights were ratified in 1791. So February 15, 1791, 1791. He, of course, is going after the bank saying, hey, there's no constitutional authorization for this. And even if you uh, include an expiration date or you think it's a small violation of the Constitution, everything beyond the limits of the Constitution is a violation of your oath. He didn't say that, but violating the Constitution is the same. To take a single step beyond the boundaries thus specially drawn around the powers of Congress, wrote Jefferson, is to take possession of a boundless field of power no longer susceptible of any definition. So he was opposing a small, even the tiniest step outside the limits of the Constitution was against their oath of office. It was against their duty. And the, the latter part of that taking possession of a boundless field of power, he recognized, like so many of the founders and old revolutionaries, that once you give them that small step, they will use that. Once they get their foot in the door to expand on the powers of, uh, of government, they will continue doing this, continue doing this. So abiding by one's oath means following the Constitution to the T. That doesn't necessarily mean Thomas Jefferson, but to the T. Here's Archibald McLean in, uh, oh man, is he the North Carolina? Archibald McLean is North Carolina. I'm pretty sure. Uh, July 28th, 1788, in the ratifying uh, debates, he said, the officers are only to be sworn to support the Constitution, nothing else. They're support, they swear to support the Constitution and therefore will only be bound by their oath so far as it shall be strictly pursued. So it's not just kind of a loose, oh, I'll kind of do stuff, you know, they give me something to vote on and I'll vote on it and I'm just following my duties. No, strictly pursuing the Constitution, of course, as ratified by the people of the several states. McLean continued, no officer will be bound by his oath to support any act that would violate the principles of the Constitution. You can't support any act. Well, you're not bound by it. We're going to take it a little bit further than that uh, in, in a, a few minutes here. It's not just that they're not bound. If you're taking an oath to support it, when you see something that's a violation of the Constitution, it's not just that you don't help it out. It's your duty to try to stop that. I'll go to Jefferson, St. George Tucker, and a few others on this in just a couple of minutes. Here's Edmund Randolph with the same type of view. This is in the Virginia Ratifying Convention, June 10th, 1788. So I'm pretty sure McLean was North Carolina. I apologize for getting that off. It's morning still. The Senate, at least for me, the senators and representatives, members of the state legislatures, and executive and judicial officers are bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. This only binds them to support it in the exercise of the powers constitutionally given to it. So, I'm given it. So this is basically Supremacy Clause 101. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and the acts of Congress or acts of the federal government are supreme when they're in pursuance of the Constitution. So you're not only bound to support the Constitution in the exercise of powers constitutionally given to the government. I'm going to get more into uh, Jefferson and Tucker, even a little Alexander Hamilton of all people, uh, in just a moment. But I want to take a quick moment and point out that everything that I'm mentioning here, I will, you know, almost every episode, even though I mention this every single episode, I get an email or a direct message or something that says, hey, Bolden, where did you, uh, you said that uh, Edmund Randolph said blank, or somebody said this, or there's an article you referenced. Where can I find that? Well, every single episode, about one to two hours after the live stream is done, I publish an individual individual blog post for each episode over at 10 amendmentcentercom slash path to liberty. And there you're going to find all the different platforms we're on. We're, uh, of course, live streaming on the mainstream ones like YouTube and Twitch and Twitter and Facebook. We also live stream at Rumble and Odyssey. I like to see the growth over at those two platforms, Rumble and Odyssey. That makes me very excited. I appreciate those. Wherever you are, I appreciate you being there. But it's kind of cool to be outside of those mainstream platforms as well. 
but we also have audio-only versions on the podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify, and elsewhere. But in every episode blog post, there's a section, Show Links, where I include generally all the stuff that I'm referencing in the episode. Sometimes I get a little lazy or run out of time. Uh, I promise to do my best to get everything in there today. I think I've got all the links in my notes here, so it should be pretty easy peasy. But 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty is where you're going to find uh, those references. I'm going to take a look over in the live chat for just a moment before getting back here and say hello to everyone who has joined me here live. And again, I appreciate you, whether you are here live, watching in the archive, listening, video, doesn't matter, whatever platform. Thank you so much. There's Senator DT, Dixie Strong in Bama, Bastiat, says Missouri, the best state in this beautiful union. (laughs) That's awesome. John Reim or Reim, I apologize if I get your name wrong. I think I've said that before. Joseph Griesen, Haji, good to see you. George Costanza as a political, I got to read this comment. I wasn't planning on going into comments right now, but anybody mentioning Costanza on this, a political oath breaker, quote, was not upholding the oath of office wrong because if someone had told me, (laughs) that's pretty funny, Haji, good quote, Liberty Spike in North Carolina, Majestic, Leslie G, good to see you in Missouri as well, Ivana, Tim Martin, and everyone else. I know I'm missing a few people, but remember, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. I will try to get back to some comments a little bit later in the episode today or maybe tomorrow. I don't have a lot of content to cover today, so I might be able to answer some questions. Uh, Again, thank you so much for being here. But let's get back to this. So we're talking about the oath of office only binding them to support those things that are done in pursuance of the Constitution. And if we're going to be Jeffersonian, if we're going to be like Archibald McLean, Edmund Randolph, James Madison, whatever, the founding generation recognized that the federal government had powers, that, as James Madison put it, that are few and defined. Those reserved to the states and the people are numerous and indefinite. Few and defined does not equate largest government in history. Tens of trillions of dollars in debt, the massive amount of programs, foreign and domestic. This has nothing to do with the constitution of the founders and ratifiers. It is so far from it, it is even further from it than what they had uh, fought a long bloody war to get away from against the British. The only difference, I think, is just a technicality. The British Parliament claimed power under the Declaratory Act of 1766 over the colonies, quote, in all cases whatsoever. Everyone from John Hancock to Thomas Paine and others in between recognized that the re- the war for independence really was an outgrowth of that because you couldn't make a deal with them as long as they continued to claim unlimited power. Today, they're very, very close with that, with their twisted view of the supremacy clause, where they take the view that uh, uh, federal acts are always supreme until the federal government decides that it made a mistake. I mean, that's almost the same And mind you, they certainly exercise this nearly unlimited power in far more ways than the British did. So this has got nothing to do with constitutional government. Most of what we live under today and most is an understatement. So what would an oath supporter do? What if someone who is honoring their oath, how would they deal with? Man, there's a lot to deal with. And this tells me, and here's from St. George Tucker in his view of the Constitution of the United States, 1803. This tells me that it's a really bad idea to run for office unless you've got more backbone than me, than anyone that you know. I mean, way more than me, because there's no way I would be able to do what needs to be done once you take that oath of office, because it is serious business. Here, uh, St. George Tucker ties it in with the supremacy clause. Because if you're supporting your oath, you're only supporting those things that are constitutional. And if you're only supporting those things that are constitutional, you have to understand what that means. Here it is breaking it down. Acts of Congress to be binding must be made pursuant to the Constitution. Otherwise, they are not laws, but a mere nullity, or what is worse, acts of usurpation. Usurpation, as we know, and I know you guys who are regular viewers or listeners of the show, you know that term very well. A lot of other people don't. If I were to walk into the local grocery store and say, oh, you've you've usurped my authority to, I don't know, whatever it may be, people would look at me weird, of course. Usurpation is theft of power. This is when government exercises power that the sovereign people of the several states never authorize the government to exercise. This is almost everything, 24-7, 365 constantly 
some level of government is doing something that it's not authorized to do. In fact, most levels of government, like the very existence of the ATF, the DEA, and so many other federal agencies, their very existence is a violation of the Constitution. It is constant. And acts of usurpation of St. George Tucker was con were considered treasonous against the sovereignty of the people because if the people hold final authority, and as George Mason told us back in 1775, that all power comes from the people— if government does stuff that the people haven't authorized, well, this is really bad news. Anyway, so those acts that are in pursuance of the Constitution are legit. Everything else is not a law, well, and they should be treated that way, too, and I'll get to that in a moment. The people, he said, are not only not bound by them, but the several departments and officers of the government, both federal and state, are bound by oath to oppose them. And Tucker highlighted, bound by oath to oppose them, not just merely sit idly by, not complain about it, not support it because it's the lesser of two evils. Oh, we've got two options, either this bad, this default, or this doesn't get paid. And I'm just putting in context of that current uh, monetary or spending debate, debt debate of today. But you can apply this to basically anything. So many times we're told, oh, well, I'm going to choose this versus that. And then if you press the person, well, what about the Constitution? Well, I'm just taking the lesser option. But the lesser violation of the Constitution is still a violation of the Constitution. And if we're going to be constitutionalists, then you got to go with that Jeffersonian approach. A single step is a step too far. It doesn't matter how big or small that step may be. So the people are not only bound by them. And um, I had... I was off on Monday. It was nice to get an extra day and get caught up and spend time uh, recovering my back still, but working on that slowly but surely. But a few years ago, I'd done an episode about Patrick Henry's Virginia Resolves Against the Stamp Act, which were 11 days after he took his oath of office. He took his oath of office 11 days prior, his 29th birthday on May 29th, 1765. What does Patrick Henry do with one of his first things that he's doing once in office? He sees the Stamp Act as crossing the line in the sand. The, the, the empire, parliament, is only allowed to do general stuff, but stuff that deals with internal policy and taxation, as Patrick Henry put it, well, those are only things, those are things that only the local legislature, the people in the, the, the colony of Virginia, or whatever colony, but he was talking about Virginia, could make decisions on. And as soon as they crossed that line, he specifically said, you are not bound to obey them. St. George Tucker, so many decades later, had the same view. As soon as they go beyond the limits of the Constitution, the people are not bound by them. And then the several departments, so if you're, as soon as you're taking an oath of office, you're putting yourself in a very difficult situation. You better have the backbone or you're part of the problem. You're bound by oath to oppose them. For, and here's how Tucker put it, for being bound by oath to support the Constitution, they must violate that oath whenever they give their sanction by obedience or otherwise to any unconstitutional act of any department of the government. So you're giving sanction through silence. You give sanction by obedience. You give sanction by choosing, by supporting, voting in favor, supporting, enforcing, taking any action to help these people out, violating our Constitution and our liberty, which happens constantly. So this is the kind of position that I go with when I say they all suck, and that is the biggest understatement of the world. Thomas Jefferson, so Tucker published that in 1803. Jefferson thought this was an incredible uh, text. He really, well, anyways, that, that's probably another episode. So the following year, Jefferson describes to Abigail Adams that he basically put this into practice. Now, he didn't cite Tucker here, but of course, he and Abigail, who had a long uh, correspondence, and along with her husband, John, they were frenemies at the end, but they had certain serious problems in the late 1700s because Adams signed the hated and unconstitutional Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798. And Jefferson opposed them, and he's explaining to Abigail what went down, why he had to do this. He said, I discharged every person under punishment or prosecution under the sedition law because I considered and now consider that law to be a nullity as absolute and as palpable as if Congress had ordered us to fall down and worship a golden image. It's the same type of a viewpoint 
that Tucker had. Soon as they do any act outside the Constitution, it's a nullity. It deserves to be treated that way. No one should be, no one is bound to obey them. But people who take an oath of office, they're bound to do something to oppose them. And this is really just what Jefferson, uh, Je- this is what Jefferson had to say about it. And that it was as much my duty to arrest its execution in every stage. It was his duty, not just a good idea, not just something that his constituents wanted, not something that was politically popular. He didn't care because it was his duty once once he took an oath of office. If he considered something unconstitutional, it was his duty to try to arrest the progress of that evil at every turn possible. It was my duty to arrest its execution in every stage, as it would have been to have rescued from the fiery furnace those who should have been cast into it for refusing to worship their image. It was accordingly done in every instance, without asking what the offenders had done or against whom they offended, but whether the pains they were suffering were inflicted under the pretended sedition law. So... Oh, you, what you would hear today is, OK, uh, sure, the, the the war on drugs is unconstitutional, but what are you going to do? Let criminals go free? And that's the same type of a situation that Jefferson was in. He recognized that, sure, maybe some of these people may have been bad people. Maybe some of these people had bad intentions and they violated, clearly violated the Sedition Act. But he considered the Sedition Act unconstitutional on its face. So as a president, he had to actually stop them from being held in prison for that. He had to pardon them. That was his duty. That was what he was able to do. He said the obligation of an oath to protect the Constitution violated by an unauthorized act of Congress. He's basically saying, well, the people can decide what my motives were, but I'm telling you right here, my motives were my duty to the Constitution. Here's Alexander Hamilton in Federalist number 33 some years earlier. He pointed out, now mind you, well, he pointed out, now mind you, Hamilton was a huge flip-flopper, but here he is supporting the Constitution and pointing out, pointing us to this same type of a view. He said, it will not follow from this doctrine of supremacy that acts of the large society which are not pursuant to its constitutional powers but which are invasions of the residuary authorities of the smaller societies will become the supreme law of the land. So acts of the federal government that are not part of its delegated powers are not supreme law. They are not the supreme law of the land because they're not pursuant to the Constitution. He said these will be merely acts of usurpation and will deserve to be treated as such. And how do you treat an act of usurpation? Will you ignore it? You take it, If you've taken an oath of office, you do everything you can to oppose it and resist it, to arrest its execution in every stage possible, as Jefferson said. And, well, there's probably more that can be done as well. Here from Justice Jacob Rush, the brother of a much more famous Rush, Benjamin. He was, uh, I think, Vermont. The nature and importance of an oath in 1796. If no one's following their oath, the whole thing comes to pieces, right? And that's where we are today. Contracts and oaths, he wrote, must have some meaning. But if the inconvenience of executing them or mere women pleasure be admitted as an excuse for the breach of them, then farewell, gentlemen, to all honor and honesty. And most of the time we'll hear from people, even if they tend to agree with us, well, so-and-so can't follow their oath, they won't get reelected, or they're going to look really bad, they're going to get ousted, they're not going to get anything done. Well, what do we want them to get done if all they can get done is more violations of your Constitution and your liberty? So they have no meaning today, unfortunately, And if they don't follow their oath, we're told over and over by the founding generation that these people don't deserve our support. Here's Governor Morris. He was a big government guy. He was in the Hamiltonian camp. He said it this way. This is in the Philadelphia Convention, July of 1787. If their duty, their honor, and their oaths will not bind them, let us not put into their hands our liberty and all our other great interests. Now, I'm... Taking it a bit out of context here, the quote on its own, I think, says a lot. Like, the oath is supposed to mean something. I'll give you the context here in a moment. The oath is supposed to mean something. And if they're not going to follow that, don't put your faith or trust into them. Don't give them Don't give them power. Like, they don't deserve it. Now, he was basically saying, okay, 
he was responding to opposition because he was certainly in support of ratification. He was supporting uh, some of the plans in the Philadelphia Convention where he was giving this presentation or the speech. And he was basically saying, like, look, if we can't come up with good people to follow this, we're giving them an oath on top of it. Here's some limited delegated powers. And sure, we're being told by opponents here that, well, this is going to be read the wrong way. It might, this might be a problem. But we're spelling out how it's supposed to be. And if we're giving them an oath, and if on top of that, all this, we can't get good people to do the right thing and follow the rules, well, let's have no government at all. That's what he was saying. That's what he followed it. If their duty, their honor, and their oaths will not bind them, let's not put into their hands our liberty and all our other great interests. Let us have no government at all. And speaking of that, I figured it would be good to wrap up with a little Lysander Spooner. Here's one that I don't cite real often, but my probably my second favorite uh, Spooner essay, an essay on the trial by jury in 1852. And I think ultimately, really, it, it's up to the people to keep the government people in check. And I think that's what Morris is getting at. Certainly, that's what Dickinson and many others in the founding generation were getting at over and over that I've covered in other episodes. But it's ultimately up to the people to keep them in check. If they don't follow their oath of office and the people don't even understand what that means, then the people ultimately are responsible. But if they don't follow their oath and the people know what it means and they still support them because the other person might be worse, well, that's also a problem. We can't rely on the Constitution to limit government on its own. Words on paper don't enforce themselves, and oaths are not self-enforcing either. Here's how Spooner put it in 1852. When did oaths ever restrain a government that was otherwise unrestrained? And here we are under an almost completely unrestrained government, almost totally. Even though there's some political battles here and there, ultimately, when you're talking largest in history, that means it's the most unrestrained in history. When did oaths ever restrain a government that was otherwise unrestrained? Or when did a government fail to determine that all its acts were within the constitutional and authorized limits of power if it were permitted to determine that question for itself? And of course, he's making an argument in support of jury nullification here because it's ultimately up to that jury to determine if the law was a violation of the Constitution, even if people violated it. You know, you can vote to acquit even if they were guilty. That's the whole point. And he's saying if the government can determine the extent of its own power, this is what we uh, cite when we're talking about Jefferson and Madison and the Virginia, uh, Kentucky and Virginia resolutions of 1798 against the Sedition Acts, Alien Sedition Acts. If government can determine the extent of its own power, that power is always going to grow and grow and grow. And of course, as Spooner is saying here, even if you say, well, they took an oath to follow it, they're not doing it because it will not enforce itself. And this is the kind of information that I think it's essential to get out to more and more people every single day. Nothing helps us get that job done more than the financial faith and support of our members. Let's see if I can pull it up here on the screen. We have membership uh, plans that are start out at just two bucks a month over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. We also have annual lifetime five-year options. You can make a one-time donation if you don't want to associate with a membership, uh, whatever. It's all cool. I really appreciate your support if you're able to give it to us. And with that, I want to take a quick moment to say a huge thank you to just a small number of people who have joined us as members recently. I'm not getting everybody, but I'm extremely grateful for all your support. There's Adam here in California, Brianna in Minnesota, Linda in Washington State, Thomas also here in California, cool, Kenneth in Texas, John in Indiana, and William in Tennessee. I really appreciate you guys. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members if, uh, if you want to join them. If you feel compelled to support our work and help us reach and teach more people about the Constitution and liberty and how to defend both. And while I've got another minute or so here, I want to take a moment and uh, scroll through the live chat and see if there's anything that jumps out at me uh, to be able to respond to. Oaths used to mean a man's honor and integrity, Ivana. Yeah, and certainly there was some debate in the Philadelphia Convention, for example, talking about how oaths also signify a belief in some kind of punishment if you violate it, even if you can't be held accountable under man's law. I guess that was the way they described it. Let's see what else I have here. Talking about the militia, right to keep and bear arms, Sparrow Dynamics, dang, I'm late, glad to be here. Someone's a clown, I'm not sure. Anyways, I, I'm not seeing anything that really jumps out. Um, 
An oath is not a religious concept. I think they considered oath to be that way, at least at the time. There are some definitions of that. There's also an affirmation. I think that's why they use affirmation, and maybe that was the understanding them. To me, it doesn't actually signify one or the other. I think it is just a solemn promise based on your own morals and beliefs of how things, what you're going to do. And, well, of course, we can't trust liars to tell the truth. So liars will gladly say whatever they want to say. And uh, they will tell the people what they want to hear in order to do whatever they want to do. So I don't trust them to do that. And I think Lysander Spooner had some great insight on that. So ultimately, it's going to be up to the people to keep the government in check, whether the government wants to be kept in check or not. I really appreciate you guys being here. I hope you found this interesting. I hope it was educational. I hope it was thought provoking. And I hope to see you next time here on the Path to Liberty.